Good morning and welcome to the press conference uh, to release our 10 point plan to reduce the European Union's reliance on Russian natural gas. Uh, we are delighted this morning to be joined uh, by uh, Barbara Pompili, France's Minister for Ecological Transition, as France holds the EU presidency, and by uh, Kadri Simpson, the European Commissioner for Energy, and of course with uh, Dr. Fatih Birol, our Executive Director. The report is now online, and we will hear from our Executive Director um, the content of the report, and we will then hear from uh, both Minister Pompili and Commissioner Simpson. After that, we will be able to take questions from the media. I would like to note that this uh, live stream is, this uh, press conference is being live streamed. For the reporters on the Zoom, please send us your questions through the Q&A box. Thank you very much. And uh, Mr. Bureau, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, uh, uh, Jet. Uh, greetings from International Energy Agency headquarters in uh, Paris. Uh, dear colleagues, uh, dear friends, uh, the eyes of the world are on what Russia is doing to Ukraine. At the IEA, our role is to look at what are the implications of this invasion for energy security, economy and the environment. But our thoughts are very much with the people of Ukraine at this incredibly difficult time. Only a, a few days ago, uh, the, our uh, ministers of the 31 member countries held an extraordinary meeting at which they agreed to make an initial 60 million barrels of oil available to markets. And I hope this gives a, a clear message that there will, we have the determination not to allow any shortfall in supply in the next days uh, to come. Now, today's uh, issues, natural gas, Russia and uh, Europe. Decades and decades, uh, the European gas supply uh, has been dominated by uh, Russia. And we are what we are experiencing today is that Russia is using its uh, nature gas resources as an economic and political uh, weapon. And this is clear to everyone in the world. And uh, here uh, we thought as the International Energy Agency, we come up with a 10 point plan, how we can reduce Europe's reliance on Russian gas between now and next winter, so in one uh, year of uh, uh, time. I am very pleased to be able to present this plan today in the presence of uh, Madame Minister Barbara Pompili of France, the country that currently holds the EU presidency, and Madame Commissioner Kadri Sinsum of the European Commission. I want to thank them for their comments and inputs uh, for this work and for our uh, discussions. Only in last 10 days, uh, I convened a group of experts of the IEA working on electricity, efficiency, renewables, gas markets, several uh, members of the IEA uh, uh, Secretariat. And in 10 days of time, uh, they came up with this uh, uh, report uh, working around the clock. I am thankful to them, uh, especially uh, 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 Mr. Tim Gould, who is our chief Eco energy economist who led this work. So what we have done in this uh, report, we look at what we could do, what kind of practical actions uh, we could put in uh, place that would significantly reduce the 45% of import dependency of Europe on Russian gas, which are those actions which are in, uh, consistent with the European Green Deal and also supports the affordability and security of uh, uh, Europe. So we have 10 key actions. I want to tell them very briefly, and as my colleague Mr. Mouvat said, they are already 
in our uh, website in uh, detail. The first action, the policy point uh, uh, we have is that the no new gas supply contracts with Russia. Our numbers show uh, that about 15 BCM of the gas contracts with Russia are coming to an end uh, uh, in the next uh, few months. And not only they shouldn't be renewed, but no new contracts to be signed gas contracts with Russia, giving a political signal, but at the same time uh, requires for uh, urgent uh, measures to be taken, which I go through. The second one, replace Russian supplies with gas from alternative sources. We look at the global gas market around the world, all the gas producers, their production plans, their contracts, and we understood that EU could obtain around 30 BCM additional gas supply from non-Russian sources over the next year. This is the second uh, uh, point. Third, for security, and I feel this is a very important one, introduce minimum gas storage obligations to enhance market resilience. This is a vital part of European gas security. And our analysis suggested EU and EU member states need their gas storage to be 90% full by 1st of October. By 1st of October. And we think that it is time for a harmonized approach to minimum storage obligations, obligations across Europe. Moving to power sector, the fourth point, accelerate the deployment of new wind and solar projects. Europe is already doing a lot and, it, and it's a world leader in this area, but uh, with concerted action to fast track further renewable projects, simplifying permitting and administrative barriers, EU could get additional a significant amount of generation from new renewable projects. This could bring us about six BCM. And there is no need to cut the corners in the regulation. Just We just need to cut the red tape. We think it is important. Fifth point, maximize generation from existing low emission dispatchable sources, nuclear and bioenergy. A, by fully utilizing the existing nuclear fleet and maximizing output from bioenergy plants, EU could get additional 70 terawatt hours of electricity with gas demand reduction of 13 BCM. Here, one delicate issue I want to uh, mention, which may merit debate. Uh, I believe it is useful for those countries that are retiring nuclear plants to take another Look at the uh, schedule. Our numbers show that the four nuclear reactors in the EU are scheduled to shut down by end of 2022 and another one 2023. We have not prejudged the outcome of any discussion, but we think it, there may be a merit to revisit those decisions. Number six, enact short-term measures to shelter vulnerable electricity consumers from high prices. This, this measure does not save gas, but it helps the consumers from high gas prices and high electricity prices. We think uh, there is a need for governments to intervene here. And one way of doing this may be uh, through tax measures on windfall profits. Number seven, as we use uh, the gas mainly for heating in buildings, it is critical to speed up the replacement of gas boilers with heat pumps. Our policies in Europe already support the installation of heat pumps, but we think we can further accelerate this again, cutting the red tape and being much uh, nimble. Just doubling the current insertion rate, with incentives and with looking at the regulations, we can easily, easily save two BCM uh, here. 
Number eight, accept the energy efficiency improvements for building uh, renovation. Here, uh, currently, I think we have a very poor rate in Europe of the renovation. It's about 1% of the EU buildings are renovated each year. We can easily, with uh, putting the right incentive in place, uh, uh, in, uh, increase the space and we can save about 2 BCM. Our last point on heating, this is number nine, is not about policy, but it's about the consumers. It is about what consumers can do ourselves. Encourage a temporary thermostat adjustment by consumers can make the difference. Our calculations show that adjusting the thermostat for buildings of just one degree Celsius would lower the reduced gas use by 10 BCM. This would also help to reduce in the energy uh, uh, bills, but still maintain the comfort. One uh, degree lower uh, heating. The final point uh, of our plan goes to the heart of why natural gas is so central to many modern energy systems. It is it provides uh, flexibility. Therefore, uh, the uh, especially seasonal flexibility, winter versus the other uh, seasons. And uh, we think it is uh, important for European countries to push the efforts to uh, make use of large scale and long term energy storage technologies. We may not see the impact just this year, but we will need it badly to have flexibility in our systems. So, uh, dear colleagues, these 10 points I want to uh, 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 reiterate, they are consistent with the European Green Deal and the EU's climate ambitions. We are not making a compromise uh, here. We also uh, show in our report that in case of emergency, there may be some other temporary deeper cuts which can uh, be of uh, help, but in that case, we have to make some uh, trade-offs. But this 10 uh, uh, action uh, we suggest here can save Russian gas imports between now and next winter by one third, pave the way for much bigger cuts uh, for the uh, future, and uh, provide a basis for a secure and clean energy for uh, uh, Europe. I would like to uh, stop uh, here, and I would like to turn to, uh, if I may, to uh, uh, Madame Pompili. Uh, uh, Madam Minister, may I take this opportunity once again uh, for your uh, leadership and the several discussions we had in the last few days and weeks, which were very inspirational uh, for me and for the agency. And we would very much like to hear your views, uh, Madam Minister. Over to you. Thank you. Thank you, Fatih. Um, ladies and gentlemen, I'm glad to be here today with the Executive Director of the International Energy Agency, Fatih Birol, and the European Commissioner for Energy, Kadri Simpson, to discuss together how to reduce the European Union's dependence on Russian gas. France strongly condemns Russia's unacceptable military aggression against Ukraine. As presidency of the EU Council, France immediately reacted and organized meetings of European ministers from the various sectors concerned. As Minister of Energy, I shared an extraordinary Energy Council last Monday in Brussels to provide a coordinated, robust and united response on energy issues. Our first concern, obviously, has been to provide the necessary energy assistance to Ukraine. In terms of electricity, the Ukrainian grid is no longer connected to the Russian grid. We have asked European transmission system operators and NSOE to speed up the technical work for the connection of the Ukrainian grid to the European network, and we hope it can be done within 15 days. Our second concern, of course, has been the resilience 
and the independence of our European energy system. More than ever, ending our dependency on Russian fossil fuels and fossil fuels in general is essential. What is at stake is both the need to accelerate our fight against climate change and, as we can see now, short-term energy security and independence of the European continent. Everyone knows the current situation. Russia supplies 40% of the Union's natural gas and 30% of its crude oil and refined products. So we are monitoring the situation very closely. In the short term, there is no risk for the supply and security of gas or petroleum products, but we must strengthen our resilience and drastically reduce Europe's dependence on Russian oil and gas. The 10 point plan proposed by the IEA today will contribute to the thinking. We will look at these proposals in detail in the next few days in order to be able to take coordinated decision rapidly. Yesterday, French President Emmanuel Macron announced a broad resilience plan for France to protect our country in the current context. As part of this plan, my ministry is working on a set of measures to ensure the robustness of our energy system. This measure will certainly echo your plan, dear Fatih. And this issue will obviously be addressed next week at the European Heads of State Summit organized by President Macron in Versailles. There is no miracle recipe, but there are many unavoidable measures. First of all, diversification of supplies. This is essential in order not to depend on a single supplier. This topic is not new and a lot has already been done, but we must intensify our effort. Secondly, we must enhance the energy transition that we have started, including strong measures to improve energy efficiency in all sectors and an accelerated deployment of renewable energy. It is obvious that we have to go faster and invest billions to develop decarbonated energy. Each additional wind turbine or solar panel in Europe is a step forward in the fight for the climate and for our energy independence. In this respect, we remain more determined than ever to make rapid progress in the European negotiations for, of the 55 legislative package. In France, in addition to measures to save energy and decarbonize energy consumption, we have already implemented a regulatory mechanism on gas storage in 2018. Such a mechanism could usefully be extended to the European Union, and I encourage you, Der Kadri, to make proposals in this regard. In addition, in the short term, we will further strengthen our security of supply by optimizing the use of our LNG terminals. We are also working to reduce gas consumption, notably through incentives for the deployment of renewable heat and of actions for energy efficiency. It is high time to accelerate strongly on these measures. Finally, let's not forget, and this is for my fellow citizens, that there are simple actions to limit consumption as well. In these difficult times, it is vain to believe that a war on the continent will have no impact on us. And collective responsibility in the way we use and consume our energy is by far the best way to reduce our dependency to Russia. For instance, you can turn the heat down a bit in your house or start thermal renovation works. There again, European member states will have to invest billions to reach better energy efficiency. To conclude, 
I want to reaffirm that the European Union's energy system is robust, but we need to strengthen it further to keep our destiny and our energy independence in our hands. In this regards, the Ukrainian, the Ukrainian crisis obliges us. We ought to help them and we must accelerate greatly the energy transition we all have in mind. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, uh, Madam Minister. Such a comprehensive uh, frame for all of us uh, to look what further actions we should take. And also many thanks for also making a mention to the consumers, citizens of this uh, country. We are also in Paris, we are also in, in France as IEA Secretary. We are going to follow uh, uh, your guidance, uh, Madam Minister. Thank you very much uh, for that. Now, may I uh, turn to uh, Madam Commissioner now in, uh, in Brussels. Uh, uh, Madam Commissioner, many thanks uh, uh, for all uh, the great cooperation we have uh, with your colleagues for this study, but also beyond. I was uh, so happy and heartened when we met last week in your office to discuss this uh, uh, very issue. Thank you very much for the great cooperation. Over to you, uh, Madam Commissioner. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Fatih. Thank you, Barbara. Indeed, we met in person just a week ago, and what a long week it has been. Um, dear journalists, um, I would also like to start by thanking Fatih for the opportunity to be here for the presentation of the IEA 10-point plan. And I remember when almost two years ago, during the COVID-19 pandemic, Dr. Birol and the IEA were the first to point to investment in clean energy technologies as best focus for future recovery plans. The IEA showed a direction and offered solid analysis and data um, to back this up. And this was extremely helpful for us at the European Commission at a time in which we were preparing our next generation EU proposal. And we were forming a consensus around putting the green transition front and center of our recovery plan for Europe. And today, 10 point plan can play a similar role in the European debate on energy security. The Russian unprovoked attack on Ukraine has brought war to Europe and the people of Ukraine are fighting heroically for their lives, their country uh, and their freedom and Europe must stand by them. So the EU and its member states are fully committed to helping Ukraine including on ensuring their security of supply. And I have been in constant contact with Energy Minister Kalushenko. Uh, and in our calls, security of supply is a top uh, of our list when talking about energy. So two days ago, um, on Monday, uh, the Extraordinary Energy Council sent a strong message of unity and solidarity with Ukraine. And member states have underlined the importance for the European transmission operators to enable this emergency synchronization of the Ukraine power grid with the European continental grid, ensuring the necessary technical safeguards. And uh, this is important for maintaining the stability of the system and providing the Ukrainian people with electricity. And Ukraine also has um, asked for specific help in the energy sector. Um, it needs diesel, petrol, jet fuel, um, coal, also generators, and we are coordinating closely with member states to provide this support. But this conflict is not only a strategy for Ukraine and Europe, it must be a moment of awareness, a moment of awakening about uh, our energy security. The IEA has long been very firm and very outspoken when talking about the reasons behind um, the surging energy prices. Months uh, before the war broke out, um, they warned that Russian gas flows to Europe were much lower than usual, despite high prices, and that uh, this unusual behavior was not helping the market to rebalance. The war in Ukraine has made our dependence on Russian gas supply and its risks painfully clear. We cannot let any third country destabilize our energy markets or influence our energy choices. And this is where the IEA and the European Commission look eye to eye. We must set a priority objective to significantly reduce our dependence on Russian energy supply. Uh, the IA 10 point plan contains a number of concrete avenues that one can take to reduce dependence on Russian gas. In the short term, this comes through diversification, 
we have already seen a steep increase of LNG volumes to Europe in January and February. LNG imports are now around 10 BCM per month. Uh, like the IEA plan suggests, we have been reaching out to our partners all over the world, and this is paying dividends. Gas storage is another important element of the IEA plan. Uh, if current trends continue, the level of storage in Europe in April will be much lower than in previous years. And we need to start immediately to secure sufficient gas storage for, for next winter. So bringing it close to 90%. And the commission will propose concrete measures next week in this regard. And beyond the short term, ultimately, the best and the only lasting solution is Green Deal, uh, boosting renewables and energy efficiency as fast as technically possible. So we are still far too dependent on fossil fuel imports. But boosting homegrown renewables help us out of this trap. And when we look at the quarterly report on European electricity markets, published, um, the last one was published uh, this January, we can see that in the third quarter of 2021, the share of renewables reached 37% beating fossil fuels. So fully implementing our Fit for 55 proposals alone would lower our gas consumption by 23%, around 82 BCM of gas by 2030. And renewables, energy efficiency and building renovation are expected to drive future job creation also in Europe. So uh, the Green Deal agenda is not only our climate proposal, but also one for economic growth and for energy security. And next week, the Commission will propose a pathway for Europe to, to reduce our dependence from Russian gas as soon as possible and accelerate the progress towards a clean, secure and competitive energy system. Uh, the IEA's analysis is a very timely and valuable contribution to this work. So I can congratulate once again, Dr. Birol for this leadership and ability to unite the IEA members around common goals. And I cannot emphasize enough how important it is in the current situation that all like-minded countries work closely together, remain united and put their collective strength behind policies that are on the right side of history. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Madam Commissioner. Uh, we are very much looking forward to uh, uh, hear from you next week uh, for the uh, further steps you are going to take. And I, will, I should tell you once again that we are at your disposal uh, as IAS Secretary to support you, to support Madam Pompili uh, in uh, your efforts to reduce the Russian gas imports, but most importantly, to make the European energy system secure and uh, cleaner. Uh, as Madame Pompili said, I was very impressed by uh, President Macron's speech uh, uh, the other day, the, saying that the Europe energy independence to make steps there. We are very much looking forward to see a Europe which is which is a cleaner, secure and affordable energy system. And I am sure Europe can uh, uh, manage this and uh, I, I have seen many times Europe went through many difficulties, but uh, always, always uh, was successful at the end of the uh, day. Of course, working with other countries around the world, as you mentioned, Madam Commissioner, with the like-minded countries around the world and uh, in coordination uh, with others. With this, uh, I would like to turn to uh, my colleague, Mr. Muvat, for the uh, uh, question of journalists. Any thanks, uh, Dr. Birol. We're, uh, we're going to take a one minute break so we can collect the questions. We have a huge amount of interest in this press conference, over 115 media present. Uh, so a very, very large number of questions. We will collect them and be back to you in just one minute. Thank you.
Uh, we're getting a huge amount of questions. We're going to go through two rounds of questions and uh, questions for Dr. Birol, Minister Pompili, and uh, Commissioner Simpson. Um, and I realize that this is a meeting, uh, obviously, on our 10 point plan, but we're also getting a lot of questions about oil. And if I can just uh, uh, group some of them um, um, uh, as well. Um, uh, the questions about this week, the IEA announced an oil stock release on Tuesday. Uh, Dr. Birol, if you could just give Ryder right a very quick assessment, perhaps, of the impact, if I can put that together with your assessment of the OPEC plus meeting. Uh, secondly, I will turn to uh, Minister Pompili. Uh, the question from uh, John Enger from uh, Bloomberg, uh, is a reduction of one third enough uh, as envisaged in this plan? What happens if imports are cut off altogether? And what do these measures mean in terms of the cost for consumers? Uh, and then there is a question for Madam Commissioner, uh, paraphrasing it um, about the question is, which countries in Europe are the most vulnerable uh, in this uh, situation uh, to Russian gas imports? Which is that to you. So Dr. Birol first, please. So thank you very much. Uh, yes, some oil questions in the... Uh, our uh, natural gas uh, uh, discussion. Uh, yes, uh, we uh, IEA member countries uh, show the great solidarity and uh, agreed to make a initial 60 million barrels of oil available. I want to underline this initial uh, here, 60 million barrels per day. And we are, uh, but prices are still uh, high as a, a result of several uh, factors. We are uh, closely monitoring the markets. And I wanted to say very clearly that the, we have uh, more than enough stocks to take further action if warranted. The 60 million bars is only 4% of our uh, stocks, uh, what we have uh, now uh, today. The OPEC Plus meeting uh, yesterday, I can say many things, uh, but perhaps just one word, disappointing. I want to stop here. Okay, thanks, uh, Dr. Birol. Uh, Minister Pompili, please. Yes, thank you. Um, we are monitoring uh, the situation very closely together with the European Commission. And we have studied, studied a number of scenarios, including uh, the full disruption of energy imports from Russia. Uh, in the short term, our system is robust. And there are no risks for the security of supply of, of gas and oil. We are also taking further measures to increase the resilience of our energy system, which I have mentioned in my intervention, uh, such as uh, regulating gas storage, diversifying imports, and reducing uh, consumption. Uh, the cost uh, of energy transition is moderate. The first is the cost of our dependency today on, uh, uh, on Russia and uh, the disruption that uh, we are maybe facing. Many thanks, uh, Commissioner Simpson, please. Yes, um, I will, uh, I will um, continue from where uh, Minister Pompele um, um, finished her statement. Well, indeed, um, at European level, we have model different scenarios, both for partial and full disruption of gas flows, uh, with the help of member states and uh, their uh, gas DSOs. Um, and uh, this shows that um, a full disruption of Russian gas would, of course, still be a challenge and, and requires additional target measures. But uh, we do have in place contingency plans and regional, uh, regional um, scenarios. Um, you have to keep in mind that every EU member state has unique energy mix, so their dependence and the share of um, natural gas is different. And the alternatives, how they can replace gas in uh, power generation or heating, are also uh, uh, variable. But, uh, but uh, compared to the previous crisis, now we have in place a robust scheme of interconnections uh, so that neighbor, uh, neighbors can help their neighbors 
and and on top of that, uh, the investments into the LNG terminals will help us to diversify our um, uh, gas suppliers. We have reached out to the partners with whom we have pipeline connection, um, starting with Azerbaijan and Norway, um, also to well map the alternative additional volumes. Thank you. Many thanks. Uh, I'm gonna go to a second round of questions uh, similarly um, uh, allocated. So the first one uh, for Dr. Birol from Emma Granny from Globe and Mail. One of the points in the plan, in the IA plan is securing gas from non-Russian sources. Where would those come from? And what implications does that present for developing economies that rely on cheap gas that now may be scooped up by richer countries in the EU? Um, Mr. Pompili, a question on the, uh, where do you see the role of nuclear power in France and in Europe in reducing the role of uh, natural gas from Russia? And uh, Commissioner Kadri uh, Simpson, uh, is the tent, this plan in line with the European uh, Green Deal? If you could provide your thoughts on this, uh, Dr. Duro. Uh, uh, thank you. Uh, nuclear power is, uh, is a part of a decarbonized mix. And uh, in, it can help us uh, to be less dependent from uh, uh, gas or fossil fuels uh, in, uh, in uh, Europe, in France, and uh, in the world. But uh, in the short time, uh, it can not be very helpful. That's why we insist on uh, developing uh, renewable energy and uh, uh, measures uh, to, to, uh, uh, on energy efficiency. Um, but we have to work on all this, is, this issue and we, we cannot have um, a fixed or um, uh, narrow-minded uh, uh, ideas on that, um, on that issue because the first thing we have to do is to be independent or more resilient uh, from uh, Russia and from uh, other uh, countries. Um, I, I think I have answered to your question. Commissioner. Uh, many thanks. Uh, um, Madam Commissioner, please. Well, um, I, can, uh, I can tell you that uh, the IA's 10-point plan to reduce uh, Europe's reliance on Russian natural gas is a very timely contribution. Um, and uh, the turbulence of the past days and weeks uh, have reminded us, and us once again of the need to further diversify our gas supplies away from Russia and accelerate the clean energy transition. So in this regard, the 10-point plan um, carries a lot of the same values and initiatives that we have either already published or we promote for example, the acceleration of new wind and solar projects and energy efficiency in buildings and diversifying our gas supplies. So as you know, um, last October, the Commission prepared a range of measures helping alleviate high energy prices. And we intend to present a further communication next week, looking at other options available to us uh, at EU level, but also at national or regional level, even at local level, or, uh, or even at the level of individual households or consumers. So many of the IA ideas outlined today go in a similar direction with our upcoming proposition. And we will have, of course, press conference uh, after the college meeting uh, next week in Strasbourg on Tuesday. Many thanks and Dr. Biro, please. Okay, so I, uh, the question was the uh, non-Russian sources. Yeah, so what we have done, we of course look at, as I mentioned, all the gas available, the growth of supply around the world, field by field, country by country. The, uh, and what we have seen is that out of this big chunk of gas supply growth, 30 BCM, only a part of it can come to uh, Europe, leaving the others, especially for the Asian emerging uh, uh, countries, and we see it can come through pipeline and uh, LNG. Uh, uh, mainly we expect from uh, US, uh, Azerbaijan, uh, uh, Qatar, uh, and Algeria. These are the four uh, main uh, uh, additional import that we can get to replace the decline of uh, Russian gas. 
So I think this is the, uh, my colleague tells me this is the 45 minutes is finished. Uh, I just wanted to take this uh, opportunity once again to, uh, um, to all the uh, journalists uh, and the colleagues who are following us. Uh, and also my thanks go to uh, 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 Madame Pompili and uh, Madame uh, Commissioner Simpson for their great contribution and for their leadership they are uh, uh, doing in this uh, difficult days. Uh, we will be uh, at your disposal, at the disposal of European citizens and uh, all the uh, other people around the world who would like to have a peaceful, secure and clean uh, energy future. Thank you very much to you all from Paris, from International Energy Agency. Thank you. Thank mm -hmm. you.